The RCA Fine Art Talks is pleased to welcome Lawrence Leck, who will present some of his recent projects and interests in conversation with Anne Dafoe, the Curator and Special Projects Coordinator at the School of Fine Art. Lawrence is an artist based in London. His work explores the physical experience of simulated presence through software, hardware, installation and performance. His ongoing project, Bonus Levels, reflects the impact of the virtual on our perception of reality, in particular our altered sense of individual freedom and collective agency. Creating interactive virtual worlds, the audience can freely explore his digital spaces, often based on real places. These site-specific simulations place the viewer in the role of a wandering observer, encountering existential landscapes through a first-person perspective. He draws from his background in DIY music and industrial fabrication to present his work in immersive audiovisual environments. Lawrence is a graduate of the Cooper Union New York and Trinity College Cambridge. Recent exhibitions and productions include Software, Hard Problem at Qubit, On Real Estate at the Royal Academy, Performance as Process at the Delfina Foundation, Skyline for the Art Licks Weekend 2014 Digital Commission, and Continental Drift at Channel Normal. Leck is currently resident artist at the White Building and winner of the 2015 Dazed Emerging Artist Award. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence, for being here. Um, before starting, I just wanted to say we had a discussion a while back uh, when you came uh, just to visit uh, the RCA and to talk about how you could uh, interact um, within the school. And, um, and we, we discussed about a lot of different topics um, and, I kind of and different aspects of your work as mm -hmm. well. And what I wanted to call uh, the in-betweens, uh, but also pushing the boundaries uh, within different, different sides of the art world, but not necessarily only that, uh, mm -hmm. within perceptions. Um, so first, I just wanted to ask you if you could tell us a little bit more about your background, uh, where you come from, and your training within relation to architecture. Sure. Um, so I was born in Frankfurt to Malaysian Chinese parents. So I feel really much a product of this kind of nomadic post-colonial society somehow mm -hmm. that is both like a really new phenomenon in terms of globalization and also in a particular point in time of kind of culture and technology. And so I guess my interest in architecture is mm, thinking about it personally, it's more from a kind of an attempt to answer the question as of like, where am I as opposed to um, who am I s somehow? Because mm. a lot of contemporary artists now, I think, like deal with issues of identity, and from that, like by extension, think about broader issues about culture. But for me, it's more this idea of like the ground in which we psychologically exist, both growing up and being conscious about different territories, is just really different and really unprecedented. Mm. And so my interest in architecture is more about like discovering. Uh, a kind of place to exist in, in the world today, which, which is constantly evolving, really. Mm. And uh, so I studied at Cambridge, which had a very like, strong focus on the theoretical aspects of space and its production, which kind of went back to kind of anthropological discourse about um, primitive societies and how every uh, kind of city and dwelling was actually a kind of cosmological diagram that expressed how people felt about taking a, p um, a certain position in space. And in contrast with that kind of very interesting philosophical discourse was also um, a strong focus on just building, you know, bricks and mortar, this is how you make a roof, this is how mm. you build a house. So I was very much drawn to the like art historical importance of architecture and much less to the like practical aspects of how you build things, simply because I couldn't see any immediate application of that. Um, later on, when I was working as an architect and a musician, I, like, I realized that actually the basis of architecture, it's actually a vessel for property development, as opposed to this kind of wonderful mm -hmm. aesthetic exercise, which is kind of taught academically. So um, I mean, my later projects, and which took a long time to develop, but it came from a gradual release of spatial production from the uh, kind of <coughs> economics that usually govern how we inhabit cities and how they evolve over time. So somehow to 
retain the uh, kind of primordial or like really primal effects of space and how we inhabit the world, but taking it out of you know very contemporary, quite boring discussions about property prices and mm -hmm. you know mega structure developments, which uh, which personally I think it's more just a an evolution of free market economics as opposed to like a kind of art discourse. So that's why I, I've continued to explore using architectural tools of representation, 3D rendering, model making, and simulation, but yeah, taking it out of the world of kind of Boris Johnson and so on mm. somehow, to, but also to reflect back on it at the mm. same time. Because you felt you were disillusioned. I, mm. I wouldn't say, it's not disillusioned, it actually, I mean, funnily enough, I used to work on Hester Road at mm. Foster and Partners five years ago, during which time I was kind of like saving up money to like study at Cooper Union and so on. But I wouldn't say I was disillusioned with the state of the world so much. Mm -hmm. It's more a sense that I became um, just much more aware of the reality of how the world is produced. Mm. You know, and, and you mentioned the art world earlier, and I guess the art world is generally taken to be synonymous with this kind of freeze art fair, um, market driven cultural production. But actually, for me, like rather than the art world, which is very kind of limiting. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in the world of art, which is much broader, which mm -hmm. kind of brings, um, which includes like music, literature, different forms of expression. Mm -hmm. um, and you also mentioned the idea of kind of crossing boundaries between mm -hmm. things. And those, those boundaries between art forms are, especially nowadays, I feel very much um, driven by the, by the <coughs> kind of companies and institutions and products that kind of um, that enable work to be made. I mean, whether it's Adobe or Red Bull or c mm. corporate sponsorship of, or th of this and that, um, it's very difficult to, to kind of take these things away from each other. How would you process to work uh, on, for example, the series uh, bonus levels um, as site-specific works? Mm -hmm. uh, and before that, uh, before we started, you, you were like, I oh, remind me the white building, which was really important within what you <coughs> started to develop mm -hmm. in that series. So if you want to. So, um, well, just on a personal note, like I was finishing off at the Cooper Union and I knew that rather than staying in New York and then having a minimum wage job and just worrying about visa and so on, I might as well worry about all of those things back in London because mm -hmm just have more friends here. Um, so nearly n a few months before I finished, I started looking for studio spaces. And because it was just before the Olympics in 2012, I think it was m May 2012, um, Space, who run uh, a lot of studios in East London, had an open call for artists to be at the White Building. Mm -hmm. And the White Building itself, it's kind of the token um, cultural project for the Olympics. So it's partly funded, actually, here it is right here, but this is kind of mountainous Hackney Wick. Um, and the white building is, yeah. is right there. So just on the boundary of uh, where the entire Olympic Park is, which includes Westfield and the Olympic Stadium and so on. So it's kind of, of on the periphery of this whole crazy, like he hectares and hectares of Olympic development. Mm -hmm. So when I was in the, um, when I moved to the studio, every day I literally saw Anish Kapoor's insane orbit tower being put up, them building the uh, the Olympic Stadium and the Velodrome, and you know, ten minute walk to Westfield across to Stratford. So I saw the city being transformed in real time in a way that you don't really see when you're just kind of going along the high street because mm -hmm. it's this entire like tabula rasa plot, which is you know kind of complete open territory to be developed. Mm -hmm. And so that got me thinking that rather than keeping on building sculptural installations, which I, which I was doing at the time, these site-specific installations, actually what if I could do, um, what, what if I could actually just reflect what I saw happening in front of me and also subvert the process of that development so I could kind of exaggerate qualities that I felt were latent within that. So for example, the Orbit, the orbit Tower, 20 million pounds public money, sponsored by Accelerometal Steel. Um, what if 
I actually just made that more inaccessible than it really was. Because it was advertised as being this viewing tower, mm -hmm. which it is now, and it's you know, 20 pounds to go up, and you go up and you see the Olympic Stadium. So I thought it would be quite interesting to just take that to its logical extreme through virtual worlds, mm -hmm. so that you could actually gain that point of perspective, this elevated kind of Eiffel Tower-like perspective over the city, but kind of gratis for, for free somehow. So it kind of came out of an extension of just, yeah, being in a studio on the, on the edge of uh, Hackney yeah. Um Can we see a bit of maybe that? Um, yeah. Um, so th this... To mm. explain, that was a, a video game. Yeah, so I kind of built these like three-dimensional worlds and then what I do in the exhibitions, it's, it's generally interactive. You can navigate it with an mm. Xbox controller. And then I also make a kind of video essay or a trailer based on that virtual world. Uh, the video I'm about to play is from um, Skyline, which, which actually is this kind of floating train line over here, which connects different uh, project spaces and galleries from um, Artlix Weekend. And it starts with a kind of a gradual fall into one of these, one of these stations up here in which <coughs> like five or six galleries from around like North London, um, there's one from Stoke Newington called Project Number, one from, uh, and there's a white building as well here. But this was done for a recent show at a place called Assembly Point in Peckham. So it brought along different ideas about the tube strikes and how to integrate these different things as well. So in here, the, this is the space where the show was. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes, like if it kind of makes sense, I actually take that particular site and transform it in a different way in this actual virtual world. So obviously, in the, in the gallery, there wasn't a tube train like crashing through mm -hmm. um, the actual uh, top of the level. But somehow, depending on the nature of the site, I like thinking about whether to kind of critique it for example, if it's a Royal Academy, it's more about dumbing down the kind of premier institution. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's for this kind of DIY art space, it's more about elevating it and giving it this kind of importance that it doesn't necessarily have in the actual city. Mm -hmm. um, and then because it's with the um, medium of simulation as well, you can kind of integrate lots of different media. Like for example, an actual video about the tube strikes went, you know, to at this level of reality based on what's actually happening yeah. day to day. One of the hidden problems of London on a day when it's a strike is that most of the streets are ones that are inherited from history. There are very few big, wide, full of arts and from the avenues that you find in other big cities. As a result, therefore, the capacity of buses, cars, and other forms of transport to make up for underground is very limited. That means things like this, commuters waiting hours to get onto a bus. Of course all of this has um, happened. So that takes us to uh, <laughs> the, the importance of the experience as a first person within mm -hmm. your work. Um, and within that, we can think of the social um, uh, production of space, like in Henry Lefebvre or uh, David Harvey, but also the non-places that are developed within uh, Marc Auger's work uh, in 
super modernity and the airport, the uh, motorway, hotel mm -hmm. room, etc. Um, and in that vein, I'm just uh, I'm just doing a mix mm -hmm. uh, a mix of different things. But I'm just thinking at the uh, uh, psychogeography, uh, which was developed by uh, Guy Debord, and uh, and we could think at a kind of psycho virtual geography within what you are doing. Um, and uh, the study of uh, the, the specific effect of a geographical environment, but it's consci consciously um, organized or not uh, mm. on that uh, emotion and behavior of individuals. Um, so how do you actually relate to space and um, especially within the art you make, how do you develop a virtual place that is real but based on another time frame? Mm -hmm. um, and within that being critical um, and but also there is that freedom for the viewer to go through the world and just choose where they wherever they want to go and but the freedom is not real because you kind of have set a certain type of parameters mm -hmm. within that um, so I <laughs> <laughs> sorry it's like a it's many different things um yeah. I guess first of all, the uh, the idea of like the psychogeographic approach to the city by Guy Debord and the Situationist is really about this. I guess from my my interpretation, it's kind of uncovering sublime aspects of the city, which are very mundane in actual <coughs> in their material existence, but can be quite striking if you appreciate them. And these states are best appreciated when your mind is in a state of play which is not in a state of critique necessarily, it's more of a state of real-time engagement with the surroundings. Mm -hmm. And in that case, obviously, that's what games are, that's what video games are specifically. I mean, Guy de Bourg was a very avid gamer. He actually made his own board game. Board game, yeah. Um, and in this case, obviously, the I guess the first-person perspective of these worlds, it's both, I guess, a medium that is very kind of logical for, I mean, in terms of what um, I grew up with, and also does make sense in this kind of play space of the sublime. Um, in relation to the idea of um, the, the kind of real-time-ness of what I'm creating, I guess there's also certain reference with, you know, old ideas of modernity, whether that's the Flaneur in Paris or kind of the Victorian novel, which is kind of a very big, um, I guess, inspiration somehow in terms of a format that I draw from. The idea that there was a kind of technology, in this case it was kind of publishing, like mass publishing, um, which was used both for its mass appeal and also for its mass distribution, but also to create a kind of social awareness about urban conditions. Mm -hmm. And that that's for me what De Boer was trying to do. Um, <coughs> That's what, I guess, Charles Dickens was trying to do with his Victorian novels. And in a kind of more psychological space, that was probably what, you know, Mary Shelley was trying to do with Frankenstein, going back a little bit further than that, or the Bronte sisters were doing in terms of kind of uh, the gender relationships of Victorian England that mm -hmm. they lived in. So all of these things are really interesting to me, and I know that I can't, um, I'll be always very limited in the scope of what can be expressed in a virtual world, because at the end of the day, it's expressed as a video game. Mm. But if you can have just like fragments or, or hints of this, like for example in Skyline, um, in the actual tube train, I have like poems on the underground, yeah. or I have like a YouTube video of the tube strikes that we had just now. So somehow we can have different texts or videos or reference from, from the past mm. that kind of give a way of reading this virtual world so it's not seen as entertainment, but it's more seen as a kind of form of documentation of the very recent past mm. rather than a kind of critique. Um, in relation to Marc Auger's notion of non-places in which he says like because of the because the production of space is so um, multiplied by industrial production we have a lot of generic spaces like hotels, airports, lounges are all the same. Um, my critique of that actually, is that he comes from a generation where his, um, because I think he's an anthropologist, like a geographer and anthropologist. Yeah. So his kind of notion of place actually comes from this idea of 
uh, the village is the primal unit of human society. It's mm -hmm. like people belong in a specific place in conditions and kind of social structures that are unique to their particular topography or country and or social hierarchies. But for me, like what I was saying at the beginning, I grew up in a, I grew up very used to airports. So I'm actually, I feel that airports are more familiar than the council flat I currently live in, for mm -hmm. example. So for me, I don't actually see these non-places mm -hmm. as non-places. To me, these non-places are places. places yeah. Whereas if I go to typical like place-like places, like mm -hmm. a village in the countryside in the UK, it's very alienating for mm -hmm. me, you know? So it's, I think it's a genera uh, generational shift, shift in yeah. between <laughs> that. But um. yeah, he's <laughs> from, I think he's from Poitiers, yeah. which, which is a very like, like site-specific mm. French town. Yeah. Um, <gasps> and yeah, so that's, a, I think he comes from a very different place. Mm. Um, there was something I wanted to just, while you were talking about the fact that um, virtual virtuality and the limitation of that but you do also uh, create kind of frame for those mm -hmm. um, video games so more sculptural and real mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk about that a bit uh, yeah sure um because you've got a specific aesthetic that comes back uh, there isn't fire within it but because mm -hmm. <laughs> that the fire comes uh, quite often um, in skyline yeah that, sure um, so this, this, the, uh, this pavilion is actually what um, I was doing this for a residency at the Design Museum. Mm -hmm. And it's probably the last kind of sculptural installation I actually made. Mm -hmm. um, it was the kind of last one in a line of these kind of site-specific installations mm -hmm. that the last one was actually a kind of generic pavilion that mm -hmm. I thought would be a kind of frame or a portal to somewhere else. And it's, I mean, it's currently sitting in my studio and it's kind of where I work. But in the virtual world, it serves as this kind of icon or device for, um, for something else to happen. So, and it's actually, it's actually a teleporter. So for example, it, because it's burning, it serves as this like orientation device for, for people or navigators mm -hmm. in the world, because otherwise it's very hard to see what is um, being led towards. So. In certain cases, it, it actually takes people from one place to another in the case, wh uh, whether that's like to a different part of the level or to a helicopter or something like that. Um, so, yeah, some I have my own kind of quite subtle iconography in these mm. in these worlds, but it's never like completely um, overt somehow. So it's they're just kind of yeah in the landscape, I guess. Um, and this was, yes, that's the yeah, this was um, for a festival called Open Source, mm -hmm. which was uh, in, in May this year. And in it, I kind of recreated Gillette Square in Dalston mm -hmm. as if it's this kind of post-apocalyptic landscape, which is kind of a pastiche of urban gentrification mm -hmm. taken to the extreme. Um, we should talk about uh, sci-fi actually within, okay. I mean, the idea of the future and okay. uh, Oh yeah, we we'll just played it. Yeah, yeah.
that's FS. Uh, that's FS, yeah. yeah. Um, Not quite, but yeah, more or less. <laughs> Half of it uh, left. Um, <coughs> yeah, I just wanted to uh, mention the, um, um, that kind of uh, post-apocalyptic scenario uh, and aesthetic as well, uh, where it feels like we are in on another Earth almost or parallel universe. Um, and just to for you to just maybe uh, talk a, a bit about sci-fi and what, how, uh, keeping in mind the fact that it's always related to the present mm -hmm. anyway, um, but also within that time relation that you were mentioning, also the mm -hmm. the past being part of the present mm -hmm. and um, yeah. <laughs> sure. I mean, the kind of like my relatively, I guess, limited understanding of science fiction, or at least the stuff that I'm interested in, is that it takes a kind of um, a scientific or technological premise in order to kind of comment about present relations somehow. So um, I guess earlier I meant, going back to, let's say, like Mary Shelley and, and Frankenstein, I guess she was talking about creating this, um, giving life to this monster mm -hmm based on, uh, which was related, I guess, to notions of that time about like scientific progress and the kind of uncanny fascination with the body and medical science. So I think from that, even from that beginning, because some people say that basically it's like the first science fiction novel, from that beginning, there's always this kind of critical and slightly hor horrific and dystopian aspect to science fiction like going forward even to like Philip K. Dick or mm -hmm. Ursula Le Guin, everybody has a different, uh, all of these writers have a very different um, politics, politics of the body or politics of, of the city or society that they're dealing with. Um, my I think the first science fiction book I read was Dune by Frank Herbert, mm -hmm. and I think that came out during the 1960s, and it was the first, or definitely the best up to that time, science fiction novel in which he had created his entire world, like an entire kind of cosmology and solar system and religion all related to ideas about ecology and how, um, how society actually grows out of the things that planets produce in a very kind of, um, in a very holistic way. Mm. So this, I, d I mean, and this is now called, I think, world building, like this idea that you actually create the whole world that your framework exists within. And I guess that's, that idea of world building is what bonus levels definitely relates to. So whereas Frank, Frank Herbert's Dune is more about ecology rather than about social critique, whereas let's say Ursula <coughs> Le Guin is very much about mm -hmm. social critique, um, as well as the kind of Russian science fiction authors who have a very different angle on the whole kind of labor relationships between things. So I guess my interest in science fiction is actually from just kind of reading novels <coughs> I'm interested in it, mm -hmm. rather than actually like thinking about science fiction. I mean, in, in that case of Dalston that we just saw, my kind of starting point is not so much science fiction. It's, it's called Dalston Mon Amour after mm. the um, Alain René film Hiroshima Mon Amour, which is about a kind of <coughs> remembered journey through the destroyed landscape of Hiroshima, which obviously was a nuclear bomb. There's nothing fictional about that. Um, so I think because science fiction came out, uh, started emerging, at a time when people didn't quite understand how to deal with progress in technology and how that impacted their kind of quite agricultural lifestyles, mm. I think you know nearly 200 years later, it's much more, much more complex than that. Mm. So, sorry. it's all science fiction. I feel that's mm. all. Yeah. Um, and also, in the virtual world that you are creating, there isn't any other human. Um, the means of transport are usually working uh, as if someone was driving mm -hmm. it, but there is no one. Um, so in this kind of solitary space, uh, art remains the ultimate reason for the virtual to refer to reality. Mm -hmm. um, and is that that art is invincible? Mm -hmm. um, I think going back to what we were saying about there's the art world and then there's the world of art. And then I guess because in bonus levels, everything that I've kind of put in the, in the world mm -hmm. 
has been, it's, it's kind of like a conscious deci decision. In t it's just like, you know, landscape painting or still life. Everything there has to be kind of modeled and textured and rendered and, and kind of, it takes up, it has like a kind of physical weight in that space. But at the same time, it's, I, I feel that it's not so much that art is invincible because these in these games, there's nothing that is actually gained or destroyed. There's kind of no, there's no <laughs> purpose for them to exist. Mm. You know, the, the kind of cause and effect relationship that most objects in the real world have, whether they're kind of designed and manufactured or speculated upon, um, it doesn't exist here. So everything in this, in the world is an art work. But I wouldn't say it's because art is invincible, but I, it's just because it's a constructed, it's a fabricated world. So mm. it is like an artwork in itself. Mm. Um, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Um, and w when people were coming in, we were playing a bit of the music that you make. Um, mm. And um, it feels like the sound is very much related to your practice. And mm. it, there isn't any kind of difference. Um, um, and do you want to talk about that side of your work as well, um, the making music side of things? Mm. And also, you've got some a kind of brand new thing that you can show us, mm. uh, very special. Uh. Okay. So um, I think when I was first starting about learning history and theory and, and art, art history and all that stuff, one thing that I really gravitated towards, besides the idea of kind of utopia and human society, was the kind of German romantic notion of the Ges Gesamtkunstwerk, you know, where like all art forms mold into one to create this like total experience, um, which in their 19th century case was opera, because you know, you could have music and like stage design and everything. So for me, I, I guess the music practice comes quite organically and it's also because it's a big contrast in terms of how it's performed, produced, and distributed. It's, it was a complete contrast with how architecture was made, because mm -hmm. music is created in real time in the present moment, even if it's recorded and kind of edited together. It's very much about the sound being created at that specific moment in time. Whereas when I'm creating bonus levels or a sculptural installation, it is not finished until later on. Mm. So the process or the timeline of the work being made is really different. And um, I quite like having both separate, but at the same time, occasionally I do like doing performances where I kind of perform these virtual worlds at the same time as, as, as some music and Can so on. Can you see a little uh, strike? Yeah. So yeah. this was um, at a Wising Art Center uh, a couple of weeks ago for a show called The Uncanny, Uncanny Valley. And in it, I've kind of recreated a virtual landscape of Wising as it might exist. This was slightly different from my uh, previous work, though, because it's in, firstly, because it's in a rural setting and it's in an art center as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I have to take objects from everyday life, like a tube train, and then somehow say, oh, it's art now, um, because it's a place where art is already produced. So then I looked at an existing artwork there that I kind of <laughs> started, took as my starting point. Mm. So uh, just to explain the video, it's um, on the right will be uh, the video that I had in the exhibition and the kind of widescreen thing on the left is me kind of performing it, performing the virtual world with like an Xbox controller and music stuff in uh, for a performance.
时间的时候，应该会有。就是在这样逐步解离的状态下，乌鲁梅龙在二零一五年遇到了他。他希望保留其精华，同时延长其生命。但木材是有机的，衣服呢不短暂的，很少有。That we haven't talked about um, the importance of language as well within mm -hmm. what you do, um, and this, this swapping and switching between languages, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite important, uh, and the narratives also, sure, which is quite a big here. <laughs> <laughs> language, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, are you kind of? Um, I mean, that that brings in what you were talking about, uh, the fact that you don't feel like you belong to mm. somewhere, but more that you're kind of creating those spaces um, and that flexibility within mm -hmm. words also, yeah. which you are trying to translate, I guess, uh, within that. Mm -hmm. Because the work that you showed before that was um, in English, but the um, subtitles were in Chinese mm -hmm. or? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> and now it's in Chinese or? Now it's in narrated in Chinese, but subtitled yeah. in English, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess a few th things, like I realized that the, the, the kind of media or fields that I was generally drawn to were actually like kind of architecture and music are both things that are actually mm, pre-linguistic in their essence somehow. I mean, you have space and sound, which actually I think engage the mind at a more basic level than than language does because they kind of like come in at this pre-logical level. Mm -hmm. So my use of the subtitles and language in these particular video works which I don't have in the actual virtuals themselves is because I'm I'm interested in adding this um, essay-like dimension to them as well but this language thing only happens really for these videos. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's also more from like an interest in film or seeing things in translation. Um, I guess if you inquired more deeply, I might say that it's because I see everything that I'm creating as essentially a translation of a physical structure that really is there, or a translation of somebody's artwork, or this tube train, or this institution mm -hmm. into something else. Um, so there's that kind of, I guess, pheno phenomenological aspect to things. But also at the same time, when I'm, when I'm translating a Russian text into Chinese and subtitli subtitling it in English, it's also, there's a kind of political dimension to it, quite mm -hmm. simply. And one thing that um, I don't like about a lot of kind of discourse about kind of wealth and immigration and property development in London is that the the bad guy the identity of the bad guy changes quite often. Mm -hmm. So for example, nowadays it's kind of mainland Chinese investors trying to park their dodgy cash in penthouses in the city. Mm -hmm. Five years ago it was <coughs> five years ago it was like oh ten years ago it was like the Russians buying up mm -hmm. Chelsea Football Club and y using, yeah. you know, money laundering and stuff like that. And twenty years ago it was kind of like people from the Middle East doing the same thing. So 
I'm interested in using different voices from different places, not as this kind of socially worthy kind of thing, mm -hmm. but to talk about the kind of complex issues between like wealth and aspirational culture that exist in the UK very mm -hmm. deeply. So for example, my, um, my project for the uh, Royal Academy yeah. was as if it had been sold to a Chinese billionaire, as if this kind of grand institution, the pride of London or whatever, was sold to an outside investor, which is not that far-fetched a, um, uh, a scenario. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like, it, it's a commentary about, I guess, the complex nature of desire and, mm -hmm. and luxury and ident ethnic identity, which, yeah, again, it's not a political statement. It's more like a kind of observation yeah. of how, you know, Daily Mail tab a tabloid kind of culture. Mm. Uh, do you want to play a bit of this? Mm -hmm. um. uh, don't really have to explain it because it explains itself, thankfully. I guess when I was doing, it, when I was kind of thinking of what to do for the exhibition, which was at the RA as well, I wanted to think about, I guess, what my fantasy would be. And so the ultimate contrast, which is also quite honest, I guess, from a personal level, is that I would love to live there. It's just kind of so ridiculous. That would be great. And if you could actually take that kind of ridiculous kind of scarface aspirational like immigrant mentality to its logical extreme you would actually you know be a billionaire and be able to kind of buy these public institutions grade two listed buildings and that kind of thing so i felt that to do like a kind of the right kind of institutional critique there is obviously some there has to be something satirical or playful about it at the same time and so the voiceover from this is taken from a uh, Maria Baibakova, who is a Russian art collector, basically, and kind of oligarch's daughter. And she had written an article in the Russian edition of Tatler magazine, the kind mm. of high society magazine, about how to hire and fire household servants. I mean, some of the stuff is absolutely insane that she says, like, just, yeah. <laughs> and it was, and I translated it into Mandarin to make a commentary that instead of being Russian, the Chinese. <laughs>
。如果你意识到你错怪了员工，例如指责女佣窃取你的手表，但后来找到了，你应该道歉，但是不要留下忏悔的泪水。相反，说二家有一个误解，为此我想对你道歉。It's kind of insane the、yeah. kind of things that she was saying, but at the same time, it's also quite honest in the sense that it's what a billionaire would say to another one.、Mm. So, again, it's quite it's quite complex. You know, she's being honest, but、yeah. the framework that she was discussing things is kind of unbelievable at the same time.、Mm. Um, But yeah, that's what language does. It has a lot of kind of ambiguity behind it, which、yeah. is interesting when it's contrasted with kind of video game visuals.、Mm-hmm. I feel to have this like critical angle and also have this kind of eye candy rendering、mm. at the same time. Yeah, and uh, uh, triple meanings as well within the translations、mm-hmm. and all the layers that it adds.、Um. Uh, just、uh, we're going to open up、uh, mm-hmm. to the audience for some Q and A, but I just wanted to、uh, mention your last、uh, project, which is a、uh, music、mm-hmm. uh, one、uh, coming up with、uh, Code Nine. If you want to, just you did you want to play that? Yeah,、uh, sure.、Um, which is quite.、Uh, it hasn't been shown yet. It's、uh, quite exclusive. Yeah.、Um, <laughs> It's、uh, so it's an upcoming <laughs> audiovisual collaboration with an electronic musician called Code Nine, who has、uh, an album that came out last week, and it's quite interesting because for、uh, for him, it's an album that came.、Uh, it's his first solo album, for example, even though he's been producing music for a long time, and a couple of his very close friends and collaborators passed away last year. So it's quite a personal album, and. One subject that I'm very interested in is kind of dealing with the ghost of things, or the ghost of cities, the ghost of memories, or different structures that exist. So, we decided that for his album, I c- would create the Notel, which is a kind of hyper automated luxury hotel somewhere in the future. It's like kind of Airbnb, Hyatt Regency taken to its extreme, where your entire life is kind of automated for、uh, for you. And that will be the kind of setting for the、uh, audiovisual show. And in the trailer for it, it's、um, it's through、uh, looking through one of the suites, basically, kind of tour through that. <laughs> yeah. So in the、um, <coughs> last piece that, or fragment that you just showed,、mm-hmm. and there was、um, there was some kind of drones in、yep. there, but also obviously like the perspective that you use is is that kind of drone. Oh, it's a you know it's a video game thing as well. But I wondered if you wanted to say anything about that、um, kind of perspective, basically. Sure. Yeah. Just talk about perspective. Sorry, about the kind of perspective. Specifically, oh, okay, sure. So, in pretty much like most of the、um, simulations I've been building up to now, it's kind of the rendered camera has been a surrogate for the human eye, I suppose. 
But the difference with this particular project is that it's rendered in such a way that it's ambiguous whether you are looking through drone's eye view or the kind of human eye view. And also, well, with the narrative of the no-tell in particular, <laughs> it's kind of going through, it started from being this kind of architecture that is built for humans, but then when the observer becomes a non-human object, then it is rendered in a different way. Um, yes. So yeah, well spotted. It's kind of drone's eye view. But again, it's not particular. It's not completely clear. It's kind of in transition at this point where the trailer is taken from. Wow. No, I <coughs> I saw a lot of uh, details in in the in the renderings, um, like things on screens, and uh, I was wondering how do you make the decision to put something in in one of your works, and uh, wh when is it very? Uh, um, when does it stop being a decoration? How do you feel like things are have to be there, or or is it just some? You know just filling I mean? up space. Yeah. No, but what, sorry, what do you mean by decoration? Well, if you see, like, for instance, a screen, you have a sort of a symbol mm. uh, floating, sure. li like one of the last shots, or you have the, the seats. I mean, you make decisions. Of course, you make decisions. But when, w when is what, what makes a, a thing um, for you valuable enough to put in the, mm -hmm. in the scene? Right. So for every, like, every... Because I build everything from scratch so everything that I decide to put in there does have either like symbolic importance or is like a kind of memory of a that's what I that's what I mean yeah so everything does have symbolic importance so for example that video the the kind of spinning logo it's both the kind of um, logo of the hotel itself and is the logo that was used for another music video that I had done with code 9 that there are some narratives in there that we might not know about, but you have a sort of a like a script or something in your mind which is exactly adding I mean to this image story. Sure, I mean it's it's like for, for example, like when I had the teleporter pavilions, like if you didn't know I actually made it, it would just be this weird burning thing mm. that like you don't want to go in. That actually, yeah, yeah, exactly. But people, uh, <coughs> for me, I think. It's kind of like when any artist has their own like vocabulary and symbolism, I guess. I don't assume that anyone's going to like un understand everything, but that's mm. fine. Hi. Hi. Um, why are there no people in your worlds apart from the ones in mm -hmm. through media seen through another media like video or mm. holograms? Mm -hmm. Do people still exist or are you in a place where people don't exist? So I think what you're asking is, why don't I have visual symbolic representations of three-dimensional people? <laughs> no, because, so I say that because there, are, there, there is the presence of humanity in the works, both because of the artifacts they leave behind and also because of the kind of voices and, and, and so on, which, which are very much like part of the video. It's not like within the camera but they are kind of like embedded within that. And there's a, there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, like firstly, I'm much more interested in, I hopefully, people reading the symbolism behind very mundane objects, whether that's parts of the city or parts of structures or Westfield shopping center, like with the absence of people, not because I want to create this like dystopian landscape where everyone's dead, but it's more this confrontation with the city, um, as a flaneur would do, <coughs> as opposed to a confrontation with other avatars. Because obviously there's lots of different social media platforms of, uh, or virtual worlds, like Second Life is an obvious example. And I think what happens psychologically when you see the presence of another sentient being or human, right? whether it's like an AI controlling it or whether it's someone in South Korea controlling it, is that you shut down that meditative side of reading a space and you, you engage in this kind of like higher brain function, which is like, how do I communicate with this person? What's the language behind our interaction? So for me, like, it's really important <coughs> to empty out this world from that kind of social interaction because that's what we are immersed in every day, like 24 seven. 
through text and through voice and all of these different things. So for me, like, ultimately, I'd like to create a more kind of <coughs> meditative space, which kind of reflects each I individual, as opposed to a social space um, where that happens. But th and another thing to, to say as well is that we're I'm kind of like showing these as you know like video works in a darkened room on a screen. But in the actual exhibition, it's because the gallery itself is a social space, and people generally come to see these works, you know, with a friend or like on a date or with a group of people. So the way they interact with the virtual world, they have that social interaction w between themselves. So for example, you know, someone takes the controls, and then someone's like, "Oh, you've already been there." Or like, oh, that, that place looks like Westfield. And then they switch roles. So it really is this exploration um, between real people in front of a virtual work. And that's where the social interaction happens. But in, on screen itself, it, it has a different relationship. Hi, Lawrence. I just wanted to ask you um, where you see the sort of future of this medium in terms of your own development. Where, where are you going to take it? I mean, there's so many things you can do with game engines nowadays. You've obviously mixed a lot of media mm. in the stuff that you've done. Do you intend to carry on using um, sort of game engines and stuff as a in your work? And, and where do you see it going in terms of a sort of creative tool? in your own practice or in, in other artists' practice, for example? Sure. I mean, where do I see it going in terms of...? In t maybe in terms of your own practice, what do you see incorporating? I mean, it's, it's obviously a very flexible medium for, um, for sort of getting sure. your thing across. You can, you can mix a lot mm -hmm. of different types of images, sounds, everything like that, mm -hmm. interactivity in some cases. Um, are you, do you see yourself uh, uh, utilizing any more in this medium, or uh, will you stay within <laughs> this? That's or it. Oh, painting. Um, I think one thing that's really, for me, quite important to kind of bear in mind is that the general, generally, the progress of like hardware or technology or like even prosumer kind of stuff, like proceeds at a very rapid rate in which in it becomes increasingly easy to produce a lot out of very little. And for example, you see with a Adobe, for example, in the latest suite of programs, they have a lot of intelligent AI kind of tools where you just like type in seven things and then you end up with like a website with full portfolio. Not yet, but it's tending towards that way. Or with kind of Autodesk who make a lot of 3D software, it's like, you know, you like throw a phone at your computer and then it's going to give you like a 3D printed model in two years or something. So, or like, yeah, Oculus and all these kind of things. Uh, but I mean, I'm not like I try and master the tools, I guess. But I'm never. I'm very conscious of not being led by them. So the common question is like, what about virtual reality and Oculus and that kind of thing? So my, I, w the way I see it going is that in terms of entertain the entertainment industry will move it to a very uh, kind of a place where it becomes as immersive as possible for as long as possible for as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I have an art practice which is at best marginal in those terms. So things like virtual reality, which is about creating like a full immersive experience, is not so useful for me because I'm more interested in creating like an experience that I guess someone has, and then after that experience, you go back and you take the tube back home, and then you see this world differently, as opposed to like you're like, oh, I can't wait to get back and you know play mm -hmm. GTA Five or something. That's kind of not my interest. It's more like this kind of liminal space that people kind of transiently pass through, and then creates a different kind of awareness about the, this world. I guess so it's slightly different. Can you elaborate a little bit more on um, your choice of language? Like, mm. what do you hope to add to the experience um, for the viewer? Like, when you choose um, a Chinese uh, voice mm. and an English subtitle, like, wha what are you hoping to add to the viewer's experience? Uh, 
I think, firstly, I ha the first three of these chapters that I did were kind of without uh, language or narrator or anything like that behind. Um, and so the first one I did was actually a recreation of uh, the Crystal Palace. And I was using a voice, uh, a kind of dialogue by one of Werner Herzog's films <laughs> called Heart of Glass. So what I wanted to add, it's like, I didn't want to add anything except ambiguity somehow. Because if I would, what I wanted to do was to add a d different dimension from purely simulated space in which it's just like mimetic of what is already there or what used to be there. Um, my use of language, it's not so much kind of cultural or political or anything like that. It's more to actually add just this kind of parallel layer to things in which, yeah, it's like watching a film without any sound. It's a very strange experience. And it's kind of, that was kind of what I felt about the videos before I added more complex kind of soundtracks to things, essentially. But the choice of language depends on the actual site that I'm dealing with. Um, I just wanted to um, ask you a little bit more about the Wising project and the, like, sort of, uh, your association with the the tree thing as a as a folly and that as an architectural concept and how that might sort of relate to some of the other structures that occur in your environments and then also mm -hmm. sort of more broadly how that would like relate to sort of creating environments as a thing in itself. So how viewing the tree keep Well like the, the tree keep so then th like a folly as a thing. Uh -huh. And um, so folly as a thing being like a, an, you know, an unactive architectural structure that has no purpose, it's kind of purely decorative, um, and, and whether that relates to any of the ideas of any other structures. I mean, the orbit Mittel's sure. tower <laughs> is a folly. Yeah. And I don't know if, if you can expand on that or if it wasn't something sure. that happened in the project. No, of course. I mean, I'm like... <coughs> when I made my pavilion as well, the burning thing, it was definitely made as a folly. But I think it's, for me, saying something is functionless and decorative because is when applied to the folly isn't quite accurate in, in my understanding because the, the purpose of the folly is to exist as an object for pleasure, which is a very definite function, I think. And because of the uh, the kind of emergence in kind of in the tradition of like English landscape gardens, to be a place where you perceive the world around you from is like a really powerful idea. I think um, so. I'm always drawn to this idea of a structure that exists to be seen from, not to be seen as like an icon like the orbit is, but to actually access and then look around. Um, the difference with the tree keep in this case is that. For me, it's the first time I had like confronted a ruin because it was, I mean, it's 23 years old, bees are, there are beehives there, and it's kind of falling apart. So my interest in that was not just as a folly, but it's a folly that's actually, you can't use it even as a folly because you can't go in there. So it's become a ruin as opposed to this, well, kind of purpose, semi-purposeless structure. Um, and for me, because, uh, because of like personal reasons as well, this idea of this transient ruined space became more important. Not because actually I saw the tree keep as uh, an architectural structure, but because I saw it as something with a life and a finite life and a kind of imminent death, actually. So that was what I was interested in kind of reflecting on or kind of trying to speculate on turning back that process in the work. And in, in the project, in the video as well, I kind of make this proposal to kind of preserve it for the next 200 years through being like replicated through copies of itself. So the tree keep made me think about time differently, essentially, and also how to like inject an idea of myself into the work as well. Thank you. Um, I think we take it as the last, uh, last question. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.